they saw a trend. There were arcades popping up all over the country. They seized an opportunity. They could put multiple games in one cabinet and make more money off of that one cabinet. That was a tremendous leap forward in the uh, arcade business. And pushed the envelope. Another ad was an ad where had a picture of two steel balls on one side. There was text that said, you need a set of these to play one of these. And that caused a lot of controversy. The Neo Geo was just light years beyond what any other console could do. They took their licks. I just decided to pull the plug on them. They, they, uh, they killed us in Candy Thousand. But kept coming back for more. What we have done was to relaunch SNK. This is the story of the life, death, and resurrection of SNK. It begins in Japan at a time when arcades rule and every gamer has a quarter in his pocket. There were arcades popping up all over the country and in the morning when the arcades would open, there'd be lines of people trying to get in to play Pac-Man or Space Invaders. It was a great time to get involved in this, in this industry. A man named Akichi Kawasaki forms a new company called SNK. The company was actually uh, founded, I believe, in 1978. SNK stands for Shin Nihon Kikaku. Shin is new, Nihon, of course, is Japan, and Kikaku, project. The Osaka-based company wastes no time getting into the arcade business and releases Osmo Wars in 1979. Safari Rally is released in 1980, and the company makes a splash with Vanguard in 1981. Vanguard was a space shooting game and it was very popular. It was probably our second or third game that we published here in the U.S. for the arcade. SNK survives the crash of the arcade in the early 80s, and by 1986, it has a lineup of 23 arcade games, including Mad Crasher and Ikari Warriors. The setting is a jungle where a plane has crashed. And the objective of the game is to defeat the gorillas while trying to escape unharmed. Ikari Warriors was really popular for a couple of reasons. The controller was very unique. It was an eight-way joystick, but it also had the ability to, to rotate 360 degrees. It had a, the 360-degree rotation, as well as the eight-way capabilities, and nothing like that had ever been seen before. People loved it. It's a great game. At that time, Rambo was very popular, and I was told to change the character to Rambo. So I had to make the upper half of the body naked and change it to a Rambo-like character. Meanwhile, the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 jumpstarts the home market. Nintendo came out with their first home system, and that just blew everybody away. People were really hungry for our video game content. And to be able to have in the home at, at that time with the 8-bit system was just terrific. SNK wastes no time. We were one of the first 10 licensees from the Nintendo NES system. One of its first console titles is also one of its most innovative. Baseball Stars was really good. The attraction of Baseball Stars was that you can actually make your own characters in the game. This is the first baseball game that you can do that. There was something special about the cartridge itself in that there was a battery which was installed in the cartridge that allowed you to actually trade players, make changes to your roster. That was very unique at the time of the NES age. Arcade hits such as Ikari Warriors are also ported to the NES. And to help gamers make it through the game, a secret code is included. Ikari Warriors was a long game. There was a lot of content, a lot of levels to get through. If you were two-thirds of the way through the game, you lost your life. In the Japanese version, you went back to the very beginning. 
We asked if we could simply die at that spot and then recycle to that same location and pick up at the same place. So with a code, you could do just that. ABBA, that was one of the first sort of really cheesy continue codes. In fact, some people would argue the only way you could complete the game was by um, hitting ABBA to jump back in with another set of credits when uh, you died. For the next three years, SNK continues making games such as Ikari Warriors 2 and Crystallis. But the next generation of game consoles is just around the corner, and with some help from SNK, the line between home systems and arcades will be blurred forever. By 1989, SNK is an established game company with a slew of arcade hits and a successful transition to the console market. But their next project isn't just a new game, it's a whole new approach to arcade machines called the Neo Geo Multi-Video System. The company had a tremendous opportunity when it developed the Neo Geo Arcade System which essentially said on this piece of real estate in an operator's studio, it could have a two or four multiple game unit making money on one piece of real estate, and that was a tremendous leap forward in the uh, arcade business. Operators could save money only having to buy games. They didn't have to buy an entirely new piece of hardware for every new game. They could put multiple games in one cabinet and make more money off of that one cabinet. Even as the era of 16-bit console emerges, SNK has something much more powerful in mind. At that time, we had Super Nintendo beginning. We had Sega Genesis who had entered the market. We looked at the total landscape, and we still felt that there might be a place for a exclusive, special item that brought the total arcade experience home. The concept of the Neo Geo was to be able to play the same game software on both the arcade machine and the consumer hardware. In addition, with the changeable memory cards, there was the ability to connect between the arcade game and the consumer game. With the joysticks, we made it very much like the arcade joysticks. It's almost as if you're bringing the arcade home to the family. We made a product that no other manufacturer had. SNK releases the Neo Geo Advanced Entertainment System in 1991. The powerful new console has a price tag of $599, 400 more than current offerings from Nintendo and Sega. The Neo Geo Home System was an incredible system. Other companies, Sega, Nintendo, NEC, they had systems that were obviously made for the consumer market. SNK just went the other route. They just made an arcade system. It's got the same chips, the same insides, the same graphics, the same sounds that you would see in the arcade version. It wasn't mass market, and we weren't going to try to make it mass market. We never looked at it as, let's get a 50% market share and, and beat Nintendo. We just said, let's bring the arcade game home. SNK, I think, believed that they could sell a premium product at a premium price and make money doing that because, you know, at the time, the Neo Geo was just light years beyond what any other console could do. It was a truly arcade perfect experience in the home, just absolutely no difference. But the downside was it had the price tag to boot. To market the AES, SNK starts an aggressive advertising campaign and goes after the competition. Neo Geo was a very expensive system. It was $600 for the machine. It's $250 for the cartridges. It was obviously too high for anybody to afford. Kent Russell, who was the VP of marketing at the time, knew that you know straightforward marketing just wasn't going to work. So what he did is he came up with a very controversial ad campaign and just went after everybody. Some of our advertising back then got criticized, or at least it was definitely you know provocative, at you know for its time. And one of his first ads, which is pretty famous, or infamous even, is the weenie ad, where he calls everybody a weenie if they play the Super Nintendo or the Sega or anything. You know, he said, why play with those limp systems? Be a hot dog like the Neo Geo. Because we knew our engine was stronger. It was the most powerful engine available, and we wanted to advertise that. So the advertising really was, do you want a weak system, or do you want the strongest? It was bigger, better, like the big dog. Another ad later was an ad where he had a picture of two steel balls on one side, and on top of the steel balls, there was text that said, you need a set of these 
to play one of these, and that caused a lot of controversy. And that's what he wanted to do, so he, he wasn't necessarily considered very classy, but he got done what he wanted to do. With their powerful new system out in stores and in arcades, SNK leaves their fate in the hands of gamers. By 1991, SNK's Neo Geo MVS and AES systems are in arcades and video game stores across the world. SNK is banking on the idea of bringing the arcade experience home with its roster of games. The earliest games were a mix of uh, sports and uh, action titles. Baseball Stars was actually quite a cult hit as a baseball game. Then later on, you had a lot of uh, fairly mediocre uh, side-scrolling shooters and action games. Ninja Combat! Cyberlip. Magician Lord, that was a good uh, side-scrolling action platformer. Luckily for SNK, the coin-op business experiences a rebirth. Thanks to the success of Capcom's Street Fighter II. Street Fighter II came in the early 90s and defined the duty fighting genre. And you saw a lot of uh, other publishers and developers sort of hopping on board. SNK became you know, certainly the most successful company to follow in their footsteps. The first game was Fatal Fury. Fatal Fury. It was the first kind of one-on-one -on -one fighting game that we had for the Neo Geo. It had very good success. <laughs> Art of Fighting was uh, their second fighting series. Round one. Art of Fighting was the first uh, 2D fighting game to feature a scaling perspective camera such as it was would move back and forth to accommodate either close-ups on really, really huge character sprites or a view of a really big background. Yeah. Samurai Showdown came out and that was really the game that just took over everything. It put SNK on the map. One factor contributing to the success of Samurai Shodan was the one-on-one -on -one fighting, and the setting was not present day, but it was way back in Samurai days. The King of Fighters was a great idea. It um, took all of SNK's intellectual properties like from SNK's past and put them all into one game. And it also created a new fighting system where you would pick three characters and you would fight them each separately on a team, and one after another until each of them died off. And then whoever would have the last guy standing would be the winner. It's no surprise that Capcom, the creator of the Street Fighter series, and SNK become rivals. I would say we were friendly competitors. Capcom is, of course, famous for, uh, if you ever played uh, the Street Fighter Alpha series or the uh, Capcom Versus series, there's a, a sort of cult favorite character, Dan, the uh, Dan Hibiki, the sort of uh, goofy spin-off of uh, Ken and Ryu. He was created as a, a sort of joke or rib by Capcom on the fact that SNK had, you know, essentially sort of knocked off Street Fighter II to create its first fighting games. We had so many good games coming out that were really trying to take over the throne from Capcom. And the big joke, of course, is that Dan is the absolute weakest, crummiest character in the game. He's totally useless. And the funny thing about Dan is that he created his own sort of cult among Capcom fans who got a kick out of uh, playing the weakest character in the game and, you know, proving that, you know, I'm good enough to beat you even with the lousiest character in this game. While its rivalry with Capcom boils over in arcades, SNK looks to revamp the Neo Geo AES to improve lagging sales. Neo Geo CD was developed two years after the AES system had been brought home. AES system was wonderful, even though it was expensive. The cartridges, which were basically 200 and then $250 costs, it was just restricted. The Neo Geo CD was an attempt to solve the Achilles heel of the Neo Geo, which is the fact that the games cost, you know, $300-odd. The Neo Geo CD was a C-based version of the Neo Geo AES. The problem with the CD was it was slow. It used single-speed CD-ROM drive, even slower than the double-speed drives in your PlayStation and Saturn. The games were afflicted with pretty much the worst load times in the history of gaming. 
Despite promising sales in Japan, where 25,000 units are sold in its first day in stores, the Neo Geo CD is a disaster in the US. The CD was a nobly intentioned abject failure. In 1997, SNK releases the Hyper Neo Geo 64 Advanced Arcade Unit, but the system fails. SNK's dwindling profits are now coming solely from arcade games such as Metal Slug and The King of Fighters. In a bold bid to reclaim their losses, SNK will take on the king of the handheld market. It's 1998. SNK is still reeling from poor sales of the Neo Geo AES, the disastrous launch of the Neo Geo CD, and the failure of the Hyper Neo Geo 64. But that doesn't stop them from taking on Nintendo in the handheld market. SNK had a shot. SNK had pretty solid software support for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. They managed to get some pretty good third-party games at the very beginning for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. My goal. My plan for the company was to get a 10% market share at our peak. Now, admit the numbers may seem small, but we got to be 2% of the market. The system fails. In Japan, only 10,000 units are sold. In the end, you know, the Game Boy just proved insurmountable. At the same time, the arcade business takes a hit. There was a steady decline in arcades worldwide throughout the 90s, simply because of the popularity of uh, console gaming. By 1999, SNK is in the red. The company is eventually sold to a Japanese pachinko company named Aruze. One year later, SNK is a shadow of its former self. The few titles it develops are rushed and unpolished. SNK under their, their stewardship cut it around with its later arcade games. But not all the news is bad. Round one. That same year, Capcom versus SNK is released. SNK versus Capcom. Well, with SNK's characters versus Capcom's characters, up to now, Capcom had Street Fighter, and we had King of Fighters. We took these both to make a 2D fighting game. What kind of fighting game could two rival companies make together? It was like a dream match come true. Unfortunately, the majority of the profits for the game go to Capcom. Eventually, Aruze puts SNK into bankruptcy. I just decided to pull the plug on them. They, they, uh, they killed SNK in 2000. By October 22, 2001, SNK no longer exists. But the company doesn't stay down for long. Our chairman from day one, Mr. Kawasaki, that's really his company. When he had the opportunity to get out, he opened Playmore. Now, he couldn't use the SNK name, so the company he created was Playmore. Unfortunately, the former SNK went into bankruptcy in October 2001. But we were lucky that SNK Playmore could obtain the IPs for the original SNK properties. So today, here we are. They purchased the IP properties of, of the former SNK. So what they did about two years later was to rename the company SNK Playmore. So essentially, they created a new SNK. And its legendary family of games lives on. <laughs> have that cult following that will keep following them as long as they keep making the games that are their signature. In the future, of course, we aim to have new platforms for the King of Fighter projects. For example, Maximum Impact is out on the home consoles. The King of Fighters series has made the transition into 3D. Naturally, I think that here on out, it's our duty to evolve our products. So that's the direction I think we'll go. If our fans demand it, we'll revive any of the SNK series. Rather than a revival, however, we would make a renewal. We wanted to see how King of Fighters would look in 3D, and that was the start of it. It wasn't that the market was demanding that we change to 3D or anything like that. And for the most part, when we're making 3D visuals, it's better suited for the consumer market rather than the arcades. So we made it specifically for maximum impact on PS2. We'll be bringing uh, SVC Chaos, which is SNK versus Capcom, to the Xbox, and it will be fully live. From now on, we'll continue the sequels and also make original titles. And while the company is at the tail end of a wild ride, there is no denying its impact on gaming history. Boy, do they have a huge following. I mean, even to this day. 
Underdogs definitely draw the, their sort of cult following. I mean, on eBay, they, the, some of the old cartridges, which we sold originally for 200 is going, you know, for thousands of dollars. Not to underestimate the fact that they were really a, a force for technological and economic innovation in the arcades. For me, when you say SNK, the first thing that comes to mind is not a particular game title per se, but an image that this is the only company that can offer hardcore games.